Oh, Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted and honored to welcome a very, very senior entrepreneur, businessman from the US, a fellow YPO member, Mr. Kevin Fallon. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ash, and uh, very happy to be here and excited for our discussion. Thank you. Kevin is the founder and CEO of Pivotal Innovation. And as I just mentioned, he's a fellow member of the YPO. So, Kevin, before we get into uh, Pivotal Information, tell me a little bit about your own journey. Well, um, I'll give you a short version, but yeah. I was born in uh, New York City in the Bronx, believe it or not, mm -hmm. of Irish descent. And at seven years old, my dad took the whole family back to Western rural Ireland. So mm -hmm. that change, yeah. I would say, uh, impacted kind of my, my views and perspective on life. Mm -hmm. And then we came back to uh, Philadelphia in, in uh, once I graduated from high school and spent a year on the farm. Mm -hmm. So anyway... Um, my in my early days, I took engineering uh, mm -hmm. at Trexel University in Philadelphia, yeah. and um, it's it's actually impacted the way I approach things ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, engineering, I think, is a, a, a fantastic discipline. But um, so the first company I started was to automate factories for Fortune One Thousands, mm -hmm. and we did that for seventeen years. We implemented thousands of projects for mm -hmm. household names in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I got involved in lean manufacturing and lean software, both services and uh, and uh, the, the software for supply chain management uh -huh. and, and manufacturing. So that's kind of, a, you know, a thread throughout my career. Mm -hmm. And um, we live in Denver, Colorado mm -hmm. and uh, moved from Philadelphia back in, uh, in 97 okay. as part of the sale of the automation company I built back there Wonderful. in Philadelphia. Wonderful. So let's now talk about pivotal innovation. Tell me about this venture and what was your motivation to start it? Yeah, the um, so for Pivotal, what we do is help organizations accelerate value growth for lower cost. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, a consultant can say mm -hmm. we help companies uh, increase the value of mm -hmm. their businesses, but <clears throat> not for lower cost. Mm -hmm. So there's a combination of things that Pivotal has. One the, at the core is an automation system. Uh -huh. You would never imagine running your uh, accounting or your finance today with an abacus mm -hmm. or your sales without a CRM system. Correct. But most companies run the, the growth, the transformation of their business with no platform whatsoever. It's ad hoc. Mm. So there's no wonder that companies don't grow in a systemic and systematic way. Mm. But what led to this, I had a, a some background from RCA space. I think mm -hmm. we share some common stuff yeah. now, yeah. now part of Lockheed, mm. and fast forward 100 years. But um, a few years ago, everybody was talking about innovation, mm. but nobody was talking about uh, accounting. So usually that means people aren't sure of things mm -hmm. when they're talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, I did a bunch of research and I found out that one of the fundamental flaws in, in for better innovation happened, or I, I'd like to call that the same as transformation. Mm -hmm. um, but, and it means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. But the, um, what I discovered was that the underlying um architecture, if you will, or the way people think about the business itself mm. uh, was very weak and flawed. So there, so we created a systems model mm -hmm. for the business, like a better framework for people to understand business. And what's interesting is because business is a system, right? So if we can define this underlying system, perhaps we can make it grow faster in a mm. systemic and systematic way. And what we then discovered was that Innovation um, is part of a triad of disciplines, namely strategy, the execution of the strategy and the innovation. Mm. And what we did was integrated and automated those disciplines, which we call the disciplines of growth. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's a system that rides on top of the underlying business system. Right. So what's interesting is you don't have to think about the growth of your company in an ad hoc way as much as a, a systematic and and, um, and systemic way to try to grow. And uh, Kevin, how do you define value creation? 
Wow, that's uh, that's a, a pretty interesting um, um, question because, you, as you know, value creation means different things to different people, right? right. And probably that's what predicated the the, mm. the question. Yeah. And I think about it, um, it's kind of like innovation. Never, ever get into a conversation with anybody on innovation <laughs> or even value creation unless yeah. you, you both come to a common uh, definition right. of what the, what it is. Mm. So we have a little model, and it, again, it comes from some of the systems background. We call it the four C's, mm -hmm. right? And there's actually five of them, but we mm -hmm. call it the four C's. Mm -hmm. And the reason is it's create value communicate value, convey value and um, and and capture value back into the company. Yeah. So the value creation that you asked me about is one of those four C's. Yeah. And and that represents a flow model for mm -hmm. the current state of the business. Yeah. And what the, the challenge is, is how do we transform those four C's? We call yeah. that the fifth C and that is changing the whole underlying or what are the what are the constraints in each of your flow models mm -hmm. and are we attacking those constraints? Because mm -hmm. that's how you grow value fastest for lower cost. Mm -hmm. But so within that framework, value creation, then we would look at as the, the, the development of new products, services, business models, partnerships, m and it's, it's money I'm investing today that's mm -hmm. going to pay off in tomorrow's income statements, mm -hmm. right? Type of scenario, as opposed to your create, communicate and convey, excuse me, the, the communicate and convey. Mm. So the communicating value, it doesn't matter what kind of company you have. It's your sales and marketing fundamentally. Mm. But if you look at it from the customer point backwards, mm -hmm. what you can do is measure it. And the other thing is when I'm conveying value, it's really the customer fulfillment cycle. Mm. And it can go all the way back through to your suppliers. Or if you're in a bank, it can be just the service delivery to that okay. customer. Mm. But the the issue, the funny thing is, you can actually define the quantity, quality, and cost mm -hmm. at that customer point of view. So then, why wouldn't we hold marketing and sales together for the that outcome and let let the leaders, if you have separate leaders in those areas, a lot of people are using revenue officers and chief revenue officers and what have you. But if you have that separated, organizationally speaking, it doesn't mean you have to have it separated on a flow model. Mm. So your key performance indicators, you can actually uh, align along those lines. Now you can break them down. But anyway, that's very, very the kind of value creation. And I'm going to ask you a very basic question for a lot of my young viewers and listeners. Um, what is the difference between valuation and value creation? So, okay. Well, valuation is the worth of a business at any point in time, right? And it's it, it's the willingness of two parties to exchange money for for the business type Correct. of a, a scenario. Mm. I can I can liken that almost to a balance sheet concept. Mm. I'm I'm taking a snapshot in time. Mm. We can measure valuation along the lines of EBITDA multiples, um, revenue mm, multiples, yeah. whatever it may yeah, be. Absolutely. But at the end of the day the value of a company is somewhere between zero and lots of multiples on mm -hmm. your 20 times revenue, right? Correct. For these super sexy uh, mm. uh, SaaS models that mm. are going out there. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, the value creation is what I'm doing in my business. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the part that we just defined was new product development. And yeah. in a startup, that's really all I'm working on, right? Mm. On, on that element. So a lot of the other functions of the company have not even come into existence yet. Mm. So the ability to build value. So if, if I think about that for a moment from a financial perspective, mm. it's almost like I'm building a better income statement of the future, mm. right? Because I'm building the capability to actually deliver value to customers in my value creation uh, component of the company. Uh, so you could, if you want to look at them from the financial perspective, one could be equated to obviously not not equal, well equally equivalency, and then one could be I'm um, I'm improving what my income statement is going to look like in the future because I'm developing a new service or product. Very interesting. And you just spoke a little bit about startups. So my next question is for startup entrepreneurs and the medium and small uh, enterprises. What are some of their challenges to build or uh, no, for value creation? Because 
my perspective is that value creation leads to valuation. Would that be correct? Absolutely. Value creation will lead to valuation for sure. But and, and I would like to add one little thing. Mm. When you look at financial statements, they should be uh, take they should be treated as fine perfume, right? Mm -hmm. To be sniffed but not consumed. <laughs> well said. Well <laughs> because said. the internal uh, executives, depending on their mm. uh, level of uh, of uh, of you know, what would I say? Uh, they're they're um how they how they view their uh, world yeah uh, from an outside view and exec bad executives can do bad things mm. with uh, financial statements and the external public won't know won't know about it so mm. yeah there's a problem there so when when um, you know a startup or, an, or a small like, small organization reaches out to pivotal what do you do to support them Right. So we, when we um, work with companies, uh, there are several things. Number one, at the heart of our work is the automation platform, mm. right? That is at the heart because we can help people take a lot of misery and, and you know, ad hoc discombobulated thinking mm. out of their world because right. we take a, a, a flow model. Mm. At, the, at the kind of the base level, we had onto our, our platform, uh, a co-piloting service mm -hmm. for the CEO. And this is like a light service mm -hmm. to ensure that the CEO is, is focused on the highest priorities mm -hmm. relative to what they're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Now, let's assume it's a more established company, like a medium-sized company. And we didn't drill into the details of that. I got off target a little bit there. Mm -hmm. But if we look then below the CEO at the function layer, mm -hmm. what you'll find a lot of times is the function leader's are working on the current operations mm. and not actually prioritizing what needs to be improved in the company. Mm. So we have a, a what we call an objective performance component, mm. and that's you know something we do, and we include education and mastermind sessions mm -hmm. in, in that particular piece. Right. But ultimately speaking, if you get your strategy right, you can translate it through the function layer. A lot mm. of people talk about the strategy execution gap. Mm. We solve that gap as as fundamental to what we do, mm. but at the end of the day, if you get all that right, I can promise you what happens is it all, it, the constraint in every company that I've faced is execution. Mm. And, um, and we also have a mastermind session to help uh, folks with the execution. Mm. And what's interesting, a lot of the business coaches, and I've talked to a lot of them, they help the CEO and the function team as this team, mm. Mm. but the actual problem in, the, in every company is below the function layer. Right. And it's when I ask, what do you do about that? Because when you fan out the cost, the value to cost, it diminishes. The cost mm. goes up in the value. So the sweet spot for the coaches mm. is that we've solved that problem with these mastermind sessions of how do I help mm. that execution layer, the team leaders fundamentally, without costing them a lot of money. Mm. Interesting. You just spoke about your mastermind sessions. Is this uh, something similar to when, when I was reading about you, which where you have your grow the value of your business faster roundtable? Uh, yes, that's um, the, the mastermind sessions are totally different from that. But okay. during COVID, uh, we did offer a virtual workshop. Mm. And remember, I mentioned the disciplines of growth being strategy, execution, and innovation. And yep. we've integrated and automated them mm. so that companies could have a more uh, focused view of, mm. of drive and change. Mm. That workshop was actually put together to um, solve that issue. So we take, in a very rapid way, we take a, a group of leaders uh, through viewing their strategy, execution, innovation. So we have a little uh, education component, right? And then a, a little workshop, mm. you know, workshop uh, light, if you will. Mm. And we just run them through that. And then what do you want to prioritize to drive better strategy out there? That's what that workshop was about. Very interesting. Uh, my next question to you, and I've asked this from many, many senior uh, business leaders like yourself, because there seems to be a lot of confusion in people's minds, who knows how to price companies better? Stock markets or VCs? <laughs> well, excuse me. <clears throat> um, 
Well, first of all, we're talking about apples and oranges, right? <laughs> okay. Because usually the companies within the, the public sector, right, your stock market would be um, more mature companies. Correct. Okay. And, um, and, and then the VCs are more early stage. But mm. with that said, you know, all companies do have a value, as I said earlier, it could be zero to multiple, yep. multiple high multiples on, on revenue. Mm. Um, no matter what the company, right? If I go read the business books, right? It's the future, it's the present value of future cash flows. Mm. Is you know, this is what the the the, the business schools will tell you. Yeah. I like to insert anticipated cash flows there because um my real question to, to your question is, mm. is it easier to predict the future or to value a company? Absolutely. All right, it's it's one of the same, right? Yeah. So with all that said, stock markets, though, definitely have a better ability to, to price companies. I, I agree with you. Um, but I would like to mention one thing, mm. and that is, and, and it's my old company that I, early stage, I worked mm. for GE, right mm. in the transition from Jack, from uh, Reg Jones to Jack Welch. There's a guy named uh, David Gellis just wrote this book, The Man Who Broke Capitalism. Okay. And it was published earlier this year. Uh, it is a scathing report on Jack, the destruction that Jack Wells yeah. uh, did in GE by mm. through financial engineering, right? Mm. Non-value creation. Right. Um, and it's pretty sad because it was kind of one of my early where I cut my teeth in mm. my early career. And so, so yes, stock markets absolutely have a better way to, mm. to now the, the VC side and I've dealt with bootstrap startups mm. uh, venture back startups and I've been in the public markets and private markets um the interesting thing with the VCs um they're all tell you the great story mm. and they're always talking about the front 50 percent of their fund but you never hear anything in, about the back end of the That's fund so right. A few years ago, CalPERS, which is the, the yep. California mm. public employee retirement thing. So they have got, you know, billions and billions to invest. And part of their portfolio is to invest in venture companies mm. through the VCs. Um, they forced the VCs to actually tell them end of fund return on investments. Mm. And a ton of the VCs, I'm talking Silicon Valley best. They, they, they opted out because they didn't want to display the under the dark underbelly mm of the VC world out there and, mm. the, and the boneyard of failed businesses. Correct, it, it, correct. So anyway, the, the answer to that is um, in the super early stage, the mm. angel world, VCs have no interest in valuing mm. the company, if I may be, be uh, tell you my attitude on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're running, it's industrialized in the US now. Mm. Every city has an angel group. And the attempt to actually compress the value because they're running puppy mills, right? And it's now a feeder system into mm. the bigger the bigger world. Yeah. And it's really a shame in one sense, but I can't blame them because there is it's it's a you know uh, well it's a, you know it's like finding needles in haystacks That's trying right. to find good well ventures. Said. Well said. So. And yet, you know, uh, Kevin, when I was speaking to several of our YPO colleagues, you know, in different parts of the world who are old traditional businesses, they wonder, they said, you know, we've built businesses over a hundred years, created huge amounts of assets, built profitable companies, and along comes a startup, gets listed, and is uh, worth many, many billions, you know, decacorns or whatever it's called. How does one reconcile asset heavy companies with, uh, as you mentioned, future earnings. Well, uh, probably in the startups is better not to have any profits because <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you can you sell the dream or fake it till you make it stuff, yeah. right? This yeah. is all you hear mm. until, you know, Elizabeth uh, Holmes gets her, her <laughs> in prison for for uh, breaking the boundaries of truth. Correct. Um, yeah, so startups, um, yeah, and, and like you're talking about, you know, some of those um, startups, obviously, mm -hmm. take um, Tesla, not to really go there, but, you know, that's a heavy asset-based company. Take Amazon, yeah. even crazier, you know, the assets – 
in the entire infrastructure of, of Amazon. Mm. But I, I think, um, well, there's a couple of different, there's never any one answer to any of this stuff. But when you really think about um, those type of companies, they're very visionary leaders mm. in those companies relative to your Ford Motor Companies or your, your, your GMs type of thing. But I would like to kind of separate not as much as the asset base versus mm. the, the new uh, startups mm. versus the more traditional. Uh -huh. And a lot of times those more traditionals, uh, they've gotten so ingrained in operating the business mm. as opposed to transforming it. You know, if I have a blank slate, I can't think about any operations whatsoever. I got to think about what am I going to create here? Mm. And now I can dream and create bigger mm. things. So, you know, I would say a lot of times the, the in the front end, and you can fool some of the people some of the time when you have these outrageous stories, but they're not backed up with any, you know, look at the, the bubble burst in, in 2000 and then the, the yeah. housing burst in, in uh, 2008. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those, those happen, but I, I think the, um, the, some of those dreams, obviously the SaaS models, and they're totally different because mm. the cost of acquisition of the revenue line is massive. Mm. But if you have no churn, my gosh, that thing is a cash cow for, mm. for into perpetuity type of thing. Perfect. And that's what they're betting on, on those. So mm. they'll, they'll pour more money than you can imagine into mm. those, into those mm. companies. You know, why I asked you this question, Kevin, is I was watching this movie on, or the series on, on Apple TV on we work or we crashed. And <laughs> it, it's an interesting, uh, epi, you know, set of episodes where it shows that there was no assets but it was valued at some incredible 45 or 50 billion dollars and the startup uh, as you say fake it till you make it kind of thing and then this des destroyed huge shareholder value it's unbelievable mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah i mean some of these things hey you know hey humans are you know we all go back to the tulip bulb <laughs> days in in in, um, in the netherlands right mm -hmm. um people get a well, that's one of my, you know, I would say to young entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. don't follow these herds uh, out there. Really think. So anyway, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting. So I've got yeah. my last question to you now, uh, and uh, this is for the many, many young people who will listen to our conversation. Uh, based on your incredible journey and your vast reservoir of knowledge and wisdom. What would you say are three lessons you would want our viewers and listeners to take away? Well, I think if you really, well, a few things. You know, um, one of the areas is, especially people, especially consultants, by the way, Really would love us to all believe we live in this VUCA world, right? Mm -hmm. You're familiar with this yeah. um, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Yeah. Mm. And we actually don't, mm. right? This is putting fear in, so we got to pay a lot of money into these mm. consultants, what have you. We don't. We, we're living in a world that where change is accelerating. Mm. This is a great thing, right? Yeah. It's the opportunities abound. And yeah. I would say that the greatest opportunity lies ahead for yeah. society yeah i only wish i never cared about dying but i do I, I wish i were 30 years younger yeah to participate in this in this incredible future yeah. that we have yeah and then one one other thing if you're a business leader don't yeah. look at the older model of peers yeah if you're a ceo or a president yeah um and another piece of this is the business leader actually as you don't own the challenges of the functions mm. what you own is the coaching of those function leaders yeah. to think in the gap between future state currency they have the pro so i can go out there tomorrow and ask a, a group of ceos and, mm. and you know this too ash hey what's your biggest problem yeah. oh my gosh we've got all these people leaving mm. we got a, a, a the great resignation going on and then yeah. you ask another ceo my supply chain is totally messed up and blah 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 mm -hmm. and it's like no that's the hr leader's problem and that's the supply chain or your operations okay. leader. what is your key problem as the mm. leader of the company yeah. and it's truly to dream this incredible strategy but wire it back 
mm. all the way down to execution, not some lofty dream stuff. Mm. So that would be my second thing. Mm. And then every every company's growth limitation, in my mm. personal opinion, and and one of our most famous uh, transformation gurus of the time was uh, Dr. Edwards Deming, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, back there. And, and and I really agree with a lot of the things he said in the past, mm -hmm. but every company is governed by the knowledge mm -hmm. um, to solve gap problems between mm -hmm. my current state and future state yeah. um, that I dream up. And it's that ability to build a knowledge base around yeah. solving those gap problems, mm -hmm. uh, I would say. So just in, in summary in that, the world is just full of information worthless information yeah don't get caught up in the fads and everything mm. drill very deeply in your own in your own space yeah very interesting kevin on that note and your incredible uh, lessons you know i love this comment about changes accelerating the greatest opportunities lie ahead of us and as they say the best is yet to come i think uh, i'm in complete agreement with you you also spoke about uh, don't look at older models, uh, think ahead. You said, you know, that the CEOs should really be coaching leaders rather than owning up to their own problems. And organizations need to really look at the gap uh, that is there in the knowledge uh, and try and bridge this gap. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for talking to me about pivotal innovation, all the amazing work that you are doing. Thank you for sharing with us some of your deep thoughts on how businesses have been run, what are your own thoughts on uh, stock markets, on valuation. Thank you again for speaking to me and good luck to you. Thank you so much, Ash. All right, have a great day. Thank you. you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.